Hello again, everybody. This is again Joachim Dijk speaking. Uh, it is a pleasure now to introduce our next speaker. We have uh, a section of three presentations coming up before our official noon break. So the first speaker is Dr. Komroki, who is uh, as also indicated on his slide here, uh, a professor at uh, the University of uh, Florida, LA, the Lee Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa. He has many functions involved in a number of different um, activities. Originally from Jordan, who trained uh, at Case Western and at the University of Rochester before coming down to join at the time analyst uh, at Tampa where he has really become a, a leading person in the field of myelodysplastic syndrome. Without further ado, Rami, uh, please proceed. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, hopefully next year uh, we'll be able to be live in Seattle. So I'm, I'm going to cover the non-transplant part of the myelodysplastic syndrome, and uh, my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Scott, after me, will be focusing probably more on the transplant. So to start with, just to set the stage, I want to try to explain a little bit the myelodysplastic syndromes. As you know, a normal process in the body is uh, the bone marrow is the factory that produces all our blood cells. We have mother cells that live there. We call them stem cells. And those cells divide billion, billion times in a day, go into lines of production that ends to produce our red blood cells, our platelets, and our white blood cell. And obviously, the red blood cells carry oxygen around. If they are low, we say the patient is anemic. The platelets are the soldiers that prevent bleeding. And the white blood cells are family of cells that fight infection. So that's the normal process. Myodysplastic syndrome is a disease of those stem cells where a mistake uh, happens at the chromosome level or at the gene level, in addition to abnormalities in the environment of the bone marrow itself, that leads to the development of the disease, where those disease stem cells are not as good producing blood as the normal cells, so the patients will have low blood counts and the complications of low blood counts. And the disease can also have a tendency to progress to the acute myeloid leukemia, the more aggressive type of blood cancer. The name myelodysplastic syndrome, myelo means bone marrow and dysplastic abnormal looking cells. So the name is really descriptive and we use the abbreviation MDS to uh, describe it. Uh, roughly there is around 40,000 cases per year. The average age is 70, but we definitely see younger patients uh, with the disease as well. Uh, in most of the cases, uh, we really cannot pinpoint what caused the disease. I always will tell my patients it's nothing wrong they did. Um, it's rarely, rarely inherited. Uh, there are certain things associated with MDS, such as exposure to prior chemotherapy for other diseases, exposure to benzene, uh, radiation. But in most of the cases, we really don't, do, don't know what causes the disease. Now, the first step is usually making the diagnosis. So most of the time, the patient will present with you know, symptoms of low blood counts whether it's shortness of breath, fatigue, palpitations from the anemia, uh, bleeding or bruises from low platelets or infections. We check blood counts. Uh, sometimes you know, those are found on a routine examination by the primary care physician on an annual exam where the blood counts are low. And that initiates the, the, the thought of MDS. Uh, obviously there are so many causes for low blood counts. So we usually start looking at nutritional deficiencies such as B12 folate, uh, medications, other diseases that can cause anemia. Eventually, you know, the diagnosis of myelodysplastic syndrome is made by obtaining a bone marrow aspartame biopsy, uh, where the pathologist has to show either like dysplasia, which is abnormal or funny looking cells, or increase in the myeloblasts. Those are the early uh, cells in the bone marrow. Typically, we should not have more than five. If they are increased, that's abnormal. And if it's more than 20%, that's what we refer to leukemia. I think making the right diagnosis and obtaining all the chromosome makeup, and nowadays we actually order testing looking at the gene mutations, is a very important step and always you know, worth posing and making sure we have the right diagnosis, nothing mimicking MDS, 
And in some studies that have been shown that if experienced hematopathologists review this, there is discrepancy or discordance between somebody who's experienced and not experienced in you know, diagnosing myelodysplastic syndrome. The most important step probably after making the diagnosis is estimating the disease risk. And myelodysplastic syndrome, you know, it's not like solid tumor. It's not like lung, lung cancer or colon cancer. Those things don't spread around. The staging is really based on the blood counts, on the chromosome makeup of the cells, and on the blast percentage or abnormal leukemia cells. So we make a lump score uh, mostly referred to as the IPSS revised International Prognostic Scoring System, the revised edition of it. And we divide the patients into categories based on that. And those categories will allow us to estimate the disease risk in terms of progression to leukemia. And if this disease is gonna be uh, serious or life-threatening uh, in the short term. And nowadays we also incorporate some of the testing we do on the genes. Most of the places have panels that in include most of the genes that are mutated among those you know, MDS cells, not in the whole body. And uh, we can test those in the bone marrow or the peripheral blood. And they do have some prognostic information and every now and then could be targeted also by certain treatments. So once we confirm the diagnosis, we estimated the risk of the disease. In general, we think of the patients into two main categories, a lower risk disease, or a higher risk disease. The reality, and as you will hear from Dr. Uh, Scott today, that the only cure for MDS is the transplant. Uh, but the, the, the procedure itself is intense, and there is what we call transplant-related mortality. So we are always trying to weigh the disease risk versus the procedure risk, and trying to decide on the maximum gain and the timing when to proceed or consider transplant if it is doable. If patients are in the lower risk group, our goal is really to improve the blood counts, prevent the patients becoming transfusion dependent all the time, and improving the quality of life. If the patients are higher risk disease, unfortunately, sometimes this disease can progress to leukemia quickly and can be serious on the short term. So our treatment is to try to improve the survival, push away the leukemia, and maybe cure the disease with allogeneic stem cell transplantation. Now, in, this is focusing more on the lower risk disease. And obviously I don't have time to go in the details of every treatment, but I'll just try to give overview for the available treatments and some of the promising uh, treatments in, in clinical trial. In the lower risk disease, in most of the cases we are treating anemia. Uh, unfortunately, eventually patients become anemic uh, and, and needing blood transfusion sometimes and weekly or every other week base. So many of the treatments we try in, in the lower risk is really to alleviate the anemia. Every now and then we'll be treating for low platelets or low neutrophils. One of the most common used things are what we call erythroid stimulating agents. And we'll talk about lenalidomide. We'll talk about hypomethylating agents, uh, azacitidine or known as Videza, decitabine, dacogen, and immunosuppressive therapy. And I will talk also a little bit about a drug called Luspatercept or Riblozil, which is the first drug we had in a decade recently approved for uh, MDS. So the erythroid stimulating agents, those are like uh, hormones that, that you know, uh, the kidney usually produces the erythropoietin that will kick the bone marrow to produce red blood cells. So we really just give a recombinant form of it. They are acceptable first step. They are injections can be done weekly or every other week, can be done at the local doctor office. Uh, and the idea with them is to improve the red blood cells and prevent the transfusion. We usually will try them three to four months. If they are working, we continue. If they are not working, then we will stop and move to the next step. Uh, and there is a way for us to tell who's gonna respond. So we look at how heavily the pa patients are needing blood transfusions. What is the endogenous serum EPO level, which means how much is really the body producing from erythropoietin. If it's very high or the patients are needing you know, a large number of blood transfusions, then it's unlikely that we will see a response to this treatment. But most of the time it's acceptable first step, well tolerated, not much side effects, and can lead to improvement in the red blood cells. Now the other treatment available is lenalidomide or Revlimid. This is approved by the FDA for a subset of patients particularly that have a abnormality in chromosome number five. We call it deletion 5Q. Part of chromosome five gets chipped out in subset of patients with MDS among those MDS cells. 
and that's a peculiar type of MDS. Lenalidomide is considered the standard of care in this group because it leads to patients becoming not in need for red blood transfusions. Almost in 70% of the cases, half of the patients will have a cytogenetic response, meaning that deletion 5Q will not be seen, and responses typically are very durable. And we can use the uh, REV limit also in non-deletion 5Q in selected cases in patients that are just uh, anemic as well. Uh, but the major use of it is really in, in patients with DEL5Q. By every now and then, the doctor may talk about using lenalidomide in the non-DEL5Q if it's just anemia. Immunosuppressive therapy refers to treatment called antithymocyte globulin, uh, and we can sometimes use cyclosporin pill with it. This is immunosuppressive therapy. The idea is to suppress the immune system. Uh, it's the treatment used for aplastic anemia where the bone marrow is empty. But we also selectively sometimes use it in MDS. There are patients with mild plastic syndrome that the bone marrow looks empty like aplastic anemia. In younger patients, patients that had short disease duration, uh, this immunosuppressive therapy can yield high responses in, in um, exceeding 50% in some cases and durable responses. The ATG treatment is over five days in the hospital followed by the cyclosporin as a pill for somewhere between six to 12 months. Obviously it is immunosuppressive therapy. There could be side effects with it. Patients need to be on antibiotics, but in a selected group of patients, this could be an option uh, for the treatment, especially if the patient's you know, platelet and neutrophils are low as well. This is what I was referring to the non-DEL5Q where we can use the Revlimid. And sometimes you will see that we combine the Revlimid with the uh, Procrit. Now, there is a group of drugs called hypomethylating agents. This is uh, the, the ones available currently are Videza or Dacogen. Those typically are used in the higher risk, but also sometimes selectively in the lower risk, we use them if patients' blood counts are low, particularly, again, the platelets and neutrophils, uh, or if we've gone through other lines of therapy like the uh, erythroid stimulating agents, the Revlimid, and there is no response. Those hypomethylating agents can be used Typically, they are given as a shorter course than what we do in the higher risk. They can be as, you know, the Videza can be done as a subcutaneous injection. Uh, the, the cytobine or the dacogen is IV injection. Uh, they take a few months to work. Uh, so the first one or two months, the blood counts will be lower. And then eventually the treatment will kick in. In general, well uh, tolerated. And we've been looking at actually doing even shorter duration of those hypomethylating agents in, in the lower risk MDS, where we could do only three days of those treatments. Now in very selective cases, sometimes we have patients that just come with low platelet count. They're, they have no anemia, their white count is good. So there are medications approved by the FDA for other diseases called immunothrombocytopenia, a drug called l thrombopac or Promacta that again can be used in, in selective cases if patients have just low platelets. I think it's important in the lower risk MDS first to recognize that most of the treatments, if they are administered, they are going to be done for three to four months before we assess the response. It's important to check the blood counts regularly, particularly in the first few months, every week or two weeks sometimes to assess the response or to assess the need for transfusions. Many times the blood transfusions may worsen at the beginning before they improve. And all of those medications do have side effects in general, manageable and tolerable. As I mentioned with hypomethylating agents or the Videza or Dacogen, it's mainly lowering the blood counts. Sometimes we'll see some constipation. With the Revlimid also it lowers the blood counts, particularly for the patients with deletion 5Q, actually their blood counts drop significantly at the beginning. We can see rash, diarrhea with it. But again, in most of the cases, manageable and more than 90% of the patients will tolerate those treatments. And as the treatment kicks in and the blood counts you know, improve, the quality of life uh, and, and the side effects are much more manageable uh, down the road. Now, Luspatercept or Riblozel is the new drug approved by the FDA. This drug is like an antibody that works in improving the last stage of the red blood cell development. Uh, so the red blood cell development goes through several steps. Uh, there is a last or what we call a terminal maturation phase. That's where this Luspatercept or uh, Riblozel works at. Uh, 
And this drug is an injection given every three weeks. And originally tested in phase one and two studies showed promising data, particularly in a subset of patients that on the pathology, we see something called ring sideroblast, where there's some iron deposit around the erythroid uh, nucleus and uh, when they do iron staining. It's a unique subtype of MDS, typically lower risk, have a good outcome, and mostly associated with a gene mutation, we call it SF3B1. So the study really focused on that subset of patients that have the ring sideroblast, uh, and those are somewhere roughly between 15 to 20 percent of the uh, MDS patients will have the ring sideroblast subtype. And the study showed obviously that the spatercept was more effective than placebo, uh, rendered patients to become transfusion independent. And if you look also at the you know, patients that were not getting a lot of blood transfusions, meaning that they were needing less than four units every eight weeks, the responses even were much higher among patients where the treatment was introduced a little bit earlier. And as I mentioned, the treatment in general is well tolerated with the uh, reblosal or respatercept. Uh, sometimes there is some fatigue in the first couple of rounds, uh, some aches. Uh, there had been no signal of disease progression uh, with the treatment. So in general, well tolerated once every three weeks. Currently available, again, for patients that have that ring sideroblast subtype. So when erythroid stimulating agents stop working or not working, that's usually our next step among that subset of patients. An important thing to, to mention in the lower risk MDS is the issue of iron overload and iron chelation. And this is a debated you know, subject all the time. Is there benefit of iron chelation or not? Some studies have suggested the benefit of iron chelation, but there had been no big randomized study to finally establish the role of iron chelation. This is a study that looked at a combination endpoint of survival as well as hospitalization. Uh, obviously the worry when we get a lot of blood transfusions over time, we build so much iron in the body and the body cannot get rid of the iron and that builds up and can cause liver damage, pancreatic damage, heart damage, et cetera. So I would say in, in general, iron chelation can be considered in, in selected patients again, if patients have a very high level of you know, iron in the body after 20 or uh, more blood transfusions. Uh, uh, we discuss the treatment with patients. And I, I think it should be individualized because some of those medications also we use for iron chelation do have side effects, uh, but it's something to consider particularly, you know, if the patient is still uh, ongoing receiving red blood transfusions on long term. There are several drugs in, in testing in the lower risk MDS. Uh, there is a drug called Emteristat that have shown promising activity. Almost one third or 40% of the patients became transfusion independent, uh, almost uh, uh, in a durable fashion, more than a year not needing blood transfusion. So this drug now is in a phase three. There is a drug called Roxadistat that's also have been showing promising results that's going into uh, phase three. There is a drug called canikinumab, which is a anti-interleukin uh, for the inflammation. We are trying to introduce this drug early in the course of the disease to see also if we can even impact the history of the progression of the disease or there are conditions before MDS sometimes we encounter. We are trying to look at you know, preventive studies with this uh, treatment. Now shifting gear to the higher risk MDS, uh, you will hear in details uh, from Dr. Scott about the role of the transplant, which remains our only curative option. So whenever we see enough risk features of the disease, we are always thinking of transplant. And in reality, we are always thinking of transplant because it's the only curative option for patients. But we are weighing the benefit versus the risk of the procedure. And they've done those models trying to look at the maximum gain in survival, whether we go to the transplant directly or we wait. So if somebody have a lower risk disease, it's better to do the other treatment options that I mentioned and wait on the transplant. If somebody have higher risk disease and we could go to transplant based on patient you know, function, other medical problems, then we should pursue the transplant immediately in the higher risk disease. And this is just something looking at you know, this gain in survival based on the optimal timing. Now in most of the cases, whether we are going to transplant or not going to transplant, 
the non-transplant treatment that we have for higher risk disease are those hypomethylating agents that I mentioned briefly talking about the lower risk, a drug called azacitidine or a drug called decitabine, Videza or Dacogen. And this is the study several years ago I'm showing here that showed a survival advantage of those treatments, pushing leukemia away, improving blood counts, and improving the survival. So those are very effective treatments. They probably work in half of the patients, around 20% of the patients can get into a complete response, but they are not a cure. They will work for an average year and a half if they worked, and then they will stop working. So that's why we are always thinking still of the transplant in the higher risk disease, but no doubt that those treatments are effective and can improve the quality of life. Sometimes we use them as we are preparing for the transplant to try to bring those myeloblasts, the blast down or improve the blood counts before the transplant. It's important to know that you know, those treatments in the higher risk, they should probably done, be done as the studies have done them uh, using a seven day regimen, for example, of this azacitidine, not shortcutting it. Uh, again, realizing that those treatments need some time to kick in. So typically the patient will get seven days in a row injections, and then there will be three weeks break. And that month we call it a round or a cycle. And usually we evaluate things after three to four cycles to assess is there a response or not. Uh, we should not stop too early. Sometimes even if the blood count started to be low, we should we push through treatment. Uh, if somebody is responding and not going to transplant, we really should continue those treatments on schedule as much as we can, not try to shortcut the dosing or interrupt it or delay it. Because if we lose the response, we typically cannot get back that response. And many times we see in the community, uh, the, the local oncologist using a lot of uh, growth factors to improve the blood counts. We try to avoid that uh, in the setting of those uh, hypomethylating agents. Now, there's really been attempts to try to improve the outcome uh, and obviously uh, try to introduce other drugs in the higher risk, maybe in combination with the hypomethylating agents. Uh, trying to improve the bar, try to improve those responses I, I, I discussed. Uh, one other drug that we got approved this year uh, by the FDA is oral formulation of those called uh, uh, decitabine or oral decitabine. The trade name is Encovi. So this is uh, exactly like the IV dacogen or decitabine, but can be administered uh, orally as a pill for three or five days. Uh, and, it, and the results showing that it's almost exactly the same in terms of uh, the absorption of the body for it and in terms of the response rates that we've seen with it. Now, there is another drug in development called oral azacitidine that's actually approved by the FDA for patients with leukemia after they finish their chemotherapy as a maintenance strategy. I, I would like to stress that the oral azacitidine is really not equivalent to subcutaneous or IV azacitidine. So if the doctors are trying to shift between those, those are not equivalent. The pharmacodynamics and kinetics of the oral pill of the azacitidine is not the same, while the oral dacogen and the IV dacogen are the same. So at least we have an option now that, you know, there could be treatment where the patient take oral pill, but the fact that it's oral pill doesn't eliminate the need to come sometimes weekly or every other week to check blood counts because we will be expecting the same thing that the blood count could drop at the beginning. We may need to closely monitor till we see the response. But that's actually at least exciting, especially during the COVID time where you know patients could have an option where they don't have to come to the office every day. The other efforts I mentioned is we are trying to improve the outcome by adding medications to the Videza. So the Videza or the azacitidine is the backbone of the treatment. And there are several trials trying to add, you know, on it. And again, I'm just gonna kind of mention names, show you a little bit of the studies that are advanced that are what we call in phase three. So almost the, the last step before the FDA approving those drugs. Magrilumab, this is the first drug. This is a drug that targets an antenna on the cells or receptor called CD47. We actually call it the don't eat me signal that usually if this antenna is overexpressed, it's preventing our macrophages eating those cells. So if we block it, we allow almost the immune system to engulf or eat those cells. And this drug, the Magrilumab, have shown promising activity in the phase one, phase two, we tested, we've seen almost 90% of the patients responding, almost half of the patients going into complete response and a durable response. 
and it looked particularly that it worked regardless of the mutations. There are certain abnormalities or mutations when we see the chromosome makeup, several mistakes happen there, or a mutation in a gene called P53, uh, which is like a protein that's almost like a break on the cell. If we say it's mutant, it means the breaks are off and the, and the cells are like always dividing. It's known to be unfortunately a bad player and many of the current treatments or even intensive chemotherapy are not active. So this Magrillumab plus ASA have shown promising responses among the patients that have the P53 as well. Another drug is called Sabatilumab. This is a drug that targets the leukemia stem cells and also engages our immune system. And this also had a phase one, phase two trial showing some promising durable responses. And now it's gonna be going into a phase three trial. When we say there is a phase three trial, it means half of the patients will get the standard of care, which is the azacitidine, and the other half will get the standard of care plus the uh, new treatment. Another drug called Povindostat, uh, this is a drug that inhibits an enzyme uh, uh, called nedulation. Uh, it's almost like the machinery for degradation of the proteins in the system. Again, there were trials looking at the ASA plus this new drug, and it, this drug had shown uh, activity, again, doubling the responses. And there was a signal of event-free survival, meaning longer survival and pushing the leukemia away, and also durable responses. Patients that had the combination uh, and responded were able to stay on treatment for an average almost three years. So this is again a drug that actually is finishing the phase three and hopefully if those results are positive, we'll be able to have this drug available for our patients. Then there is a pill called venetoclax that had become actually the standard of care in patients with acute myeloid leukemia. So we see patients now with acute myeloid leukemia that cannot get intensive chemotherapy. Our treatment is this combination, uh, azacitidine or videza plus this pill venetoclax. And this pill also had been looked at in MDS in combination with the azacitidine. And there is a, also a phase three that's ongoing or finishing. Uh, we try not to use it out of the box in MDS as much as we can and uh, until we see the data from the phase three. But there are some patients already receiving this combination. And if so, it's important to know that the venetoclax should not be given the same way like it's given in leukemia. It should be only given for two weeks. And that this combination together is pretty myelosuppressive, which means it's gonna lower the blood count substantially. So if we do this combination, we really repeat the bone marrow after a month. And many times we have to give a break from all, all the treatments for a couple of weeks and then come back. But again, in, in the phase one, phase two, it had been showing a promising activity in terms of responses uh, for patients. The other drug called APR246 was designed particularly for the patients with P53 mutation. Uh, again, in combination with ASA in the phase one, phase two, we, we saw promising activity. A phase three just finished. Unfortunately, although the responses were a little bit higher, it was not statistically significant. So we're trying now to look at the subset of patients that really could benefit from this treatment. And it's also being developed as an oral pill. So what I was trying to show you is that there is basically several trials that hopefully will be able to change the landscape or that standard of care, which is the azacitidine that's been with us for more than a decade and be able to move the bar in terms of higher responses, more durable responses, or even maybe getting the disease into a better control before the transplant if we're considering the transplant as well. Now, in, in certain cases, you know, when the azacitidine stops working, there is really not much available option. The best outcome I'd looked at if we can get the patients to go to transplant at that point or investigational trials. But we also always recommend, you know, when the treatment stops working is to recheck those gene mutations uh, panel that I mentioned. And every now and then we'll see certain mutations like this IDH1 or IDH2, that there are approved drugs by the FDA for management of leukemia that we sometimes borrow and use in MDS. So this drug, uh, Evocidinib, or the trade name is Topsivo, or Inacidinib, uh, Edifa, are both approved drugs for patients with AML. And, in, you know, and there have been data showing that it has activity if the Videza or the Dacudin stop working as a second line if the patient harbored those mutations. So at the end, I think, you know, for somebody like me that does research in MDS, uh, 
it's exciting time because hopefully finally we are you know making progress that we are going to be able to change the landscape and of the treatment and what we can offer for our patients as i mentioned we finally had the first drug lispatercept approved we got the oral dacogen we have several trials that's showing promise you will hear more from dr scott that we've been also getting better with our transplant so at the end, you know, in, in the higher risk MDS, I, I try to think of this, what we call the total therapy. So we are gonna be thinking of the total treatment journey. Can we cure the disease? Um, can we get the disease under remission? Uh, we will be talking about combination of treatments. Uh, we may be talking about uh, maintenance strategies down the road. So hopefully again, within a year or two, we will have other options and drugs that we can offer our patients along with the transplant that I think will always be part of the equation for treating patients. I'll stop here and I'll be very happy to take very qu any question. And I'm sorry, I just tried to provide overview for many, many treatments.